in today's lecture, we're going to talk about the speed of sound. And um, if we have a disturbance, such as a sudden increase in pressure, and it occurs at some point in an incompressible fluid, well, that disturbance is transmitted to all points in the fluid instantaneously. There's no time lag. It's an instantaneous uh, transmission of the change of that disturbance. Now, we know in real life that things are not transmitted at an infinite speed. Now, if we have a compressible fluid, that disturbance will transmit or it'll transfer through the fluid as a pressure wave and it will move at what's called the speed of sound. Now, when I, I am talking, my voice, uh, when I talk, air passes over my vocal cords, causes them to vibrate, and they are, they are collisions with molecules. And when the molecules collide, then they collide with the ones next to them, and they so forth and go along. And so as um, you might expect that the speed of sound would somehow be related to the speed of the molecules. And then the, we know that the speed of the molecules is related to the, the temperature. So we might expect that somehow the speed of sound is related, related to the temperature. And later on, we're going to see that it actually is. Now, when I walk across this room, I'm a disturbance going through the air in the room here. And so as I walk, let me back up over here. Okay, so as I walk along, the air uh, ahead of me, well, my disturbance is transmitted up speed, upstream at the speed of sound. And so this disturbance that I create as I walk uh, is transmitted, and so the molecules have a chance to move out of the way. So as long as I move slower than the speed of sound, the molecules have a chance to adjust, and they'll come around, and they'll get out of the way, and they'll go around me like that. They know I'm coming ahead of time, and they have time to adjust. We're going to find out later that if we move faster than the speed of sound, then the molecules don't know that we're coming until we actually get there. We collide with those molecules, and we're, we'll create what's called a shock wave. But we'll learn about that later. Today, we want to learn about, we want to uh, calculate what the speed of sound is. And so we're going to start by considering a weak disturbance, and we consider a sound wave a weak disturbance. So we consider a, a weak disturbance or a sound wave that's traveling through a fluid, and we're going to do it in a channel. Now, this could be a real physical channel, or we could just make up an imaginary channel with boundaries that don't really exist. And so imagine now that we're going to move with the sound wave, where the sound wave is moving at the speed of sound. We'll call that u. So we're riding on the speed of sound. So if we go over to this board over here, Okay, I've drawn this channel, so we have a channel here, and that could be, a real, like I said, a real physical channel, or we could just draw some imaginary lines in the room, and they could serve as our boundaries. And we're going to ride along with the station, with the wave. So we're on this wave, we're riding on it. So to us, it looks like a stationary wave. Okay, so what we'll see if we're on this wave, we'll see a flow coming into the wave. And that flow coming in will be coming at the speed of sound, because it's a sine wave. And it has some pressure, and it has some density. And then it's going to pass over the wave. And on the other side, there's going to be an infinitesimally small in the pressure. So it'll be represented by P plus DP. There'll be an infinitesimally small change in the density, rho plus D rho. And there'll be an infinitesimally small change in the velocity. So it'll be U plus DU. Okay, now we said that we've, we're saying that our channel is of constant area, and if we make this length small enough, it will be a constant area. Now we're going to take the continuity equation, which says the flow in equal the mass flow in equals the mass flow rate out. So the uh, that's given by if we say s is the area, then and u is the velocity, and rho is the density. So the mass flow rate in would be rho s u, and the mass flow rate out would be rho plus d rho times s plus ds times u plus du. Now, because the area is constant, then ds is going to be equal to zero. And then the s would divide out. OK, so we're left with this equation. All right, so I'm going to just uh, multiply it out. And I get rho u equals rho u plus rho du plus u d rho plus d rho du. 
Okay, so you can see that these two terms will cancel out. And then we have rho du. So rho is a finite term. Du is an infinitesimally small term. So a finite term times an infinitesimally small term, we don't know what it is. It could be really small or it could be really big, but somewhere in between. And then we have u d rho. Well, that's a finite term times a infinitesimally small term. So we don't know if it's infinitesimally small or, or, or if it's actually finite. And then the last term, d rho times d u, that's two infinitesimally small terms. It's the product of two infinitesimally small terms. Okay, and when you have an infinitesimally, a product of infinitesimally small terms, we call those higher order terms. Okay, so with a higher order term, I'm going to write that up here, H-O-T for a higher order term. Higher order terms are hot, and what do you do when you have something that's hot? You drop it. So we drop our higher order terms, and so a higher order term is one where you have the product of infinitesimally small terms. These are not infinitesimal, or these are not higher order terms because you have a finite times an infinitesimally small term. We don't know what it is. So we're going to keep those. So then uh, we're going to divide by the density and we get this term right here. Uh, we, or we're going to solve for u, our, uh, the speed of the sine wave, and we get u is equal to minus rho du over d rho. And we're going to call that equation star because we're going to use that in a minute because this doesn't really tell us anything. And remember, u now is the speed of the wave. In our previous lecture, u was the internal energy, so we have to keep track of what we're talking about here. Okay, now we're going to take the Euler equation or the momentum equation, and you learned about this in fluid mechanics. And here we have dp is equal to minus rho u du. I'm going to solve for du because I want to substitute it back in there. So du from the momentum equation is minus dp over rho u. So if we plug that into star right here, we get that u is equal to all this, which is dp over d rho, or 1 over u. And then I'm going to bring the u over to the left-hand side of the equation, and we, get a, we, we actually get now an expression for the speed of sound. U, uh, we have u squared is equal to dp over d rho, where u is the speed of sound. Now, every textbook that I ever read always puts a box around this and as if that tells us what the speed of sound is. At this point, I, unless we know how density varies with pressure, it doesn't do us much good, but they always box this equation. But this is not the one we want to use. Now, let's come over to this board. Changes in pressure, temperature, and velocity across a weak sound uh, wave are so small that there is no uh, exchange of heat between the fluid elements. And also, the effects of friction are very, very small, and so they're considered negligible. And so, so, therefore, the flow through the sine wave that we just talked about is isentropic. So this flow that we've developed so far, we're, now we're saying it's isentropic, and we can now say, and I'm going to go back to the board over here, stop, okay. Okay, we're going to stop for just a second. Okay, so now we want to uh, consider our isentropic relations because we have an isentropic flow. So P2 over P1 is equal to rho 2 over rho 1 to the gamma. I'm going to rearrange this so that we have P2 over rho 2 to the gamma, and that obviously equals P1 over rho 1 to the gamma. And because points 1 and 2 are arbitrary points in the flow, uh, that means that they're constant, okay? Then I'm going to take dp d rho because we need that for the speed of sound. So dp d rho is equal to d times this constant rho to the gamma over d rho. And dp d rho is equal to rho c rho to the gamma minus 1. But that constant we just saw was equal to p over rho to the gamma. So we'll say c is equal to p over rho to the gamma. So I'll plug that in. 
I have dp d rho is equal to rho, uh, gamma p over rho to the gamma, rho to the gamma minus 1. Okay, well I can simplify that with our law of exponents to gamma p over rho. Okay, so remember the speed of sine squared we said was equal to dp over d rho. Well, we know what that is now. That's equal to gamma p over rho. If we say u is equal to the speed of sine and we give that a special name a, and that's typically what we do. We call the speed of sine, in many books it's called a, other books it's called c, but we'll use a for the speed of sine. Then the speed of sine then is given by the square root of gamma p over rho. So that means, you know, we have to know p and rho. But if we come over here to our equation of state, remember p is equal to rho rt. Divide by rho, we get p over rho is equal to rt. So we can plug that in and we find that the speed of sine is given by, or squared would be equal to gamma rt. And if we look, solve for the speed of sine, we have the speed of sine is equal to the square root of gamma rt. So now we've shown that the speed of sine is related to the temperature. And remember when we first started, we said that the speed probably has something to do with the translational speed of the molecules, and the speed of the molecules has something to do with the temperature, and now we've shown that the speed of sine is in fact directly related to the temperature. So let's calculate a few uh, examples here. First of all, let's look at sea level on a standard day. Let's see what the speed of sun is. So on a standard day, the temperature is 288.15 K. And we know for R, for air, it's equal to, or I don't know if we've talked about it or not, but R for air is equal to 287.05 Newton meters per kilogram K. And then gamma, which is CP over CV, if we calculate that, we find that it's equal to 1.4. So gamma is 1.4 for air. And in fact, gamma is 1.4 for any diatomic molecule. So air consists of oxygen, which is diatomic, O2, and nitrogen, N2. It's mostly diatomic. So it's 1.4. So if we plug in the numbers, A, speed of sound, is equal to the square root of 1.4 times 287.05, Newton millimeters per kilogram K. Whenever you're multiplying and dividing by a temperature, it has to be actual temperature, so 288.15. And then we know a Newton is equal to a kilogram meter per second squared, so the Newton will cancel out. The kilogram will cancel out. And we, under the square root term, now we have meter squared over second squared. And so when we do the math, we find that the speed of sound at sea level on a standard day at that temperature is 340.29 meters per second. Now let's do it in English units. In English units, uh, the standard temperature is 518.69 Rankin, and R for English units is 1718 foot-pounds per slug R. Now, I know we've talked about this. Uh, this pound right here, you just have to know from uh, what the units have to be, this is going to be a pound force, because if it were a... Okay, uh, okay, so if we plug that in, we have 1.4 times 1718 foot-pounds per slug R, and a pound force is a slug foot per second squared by definition, and then we have 518.69 R, so the R's cancel out, the slugs cancel out, and we're left and the pounds cancel out, we're left with feet squared over second squared, but when we take the square root, we end up with 1,116.94 uh, feet per second. That's the speed of sound at sea level. So I have an example I want to do here. Here we have uh, air entering the inlet of an engine of a jet aircraft. The inlet region acts as a diffuser to reduce the speed of the air prior to entering the compressor. And the idea when you reduce that speed is to get the temperature and pressure as high as you possibly can prior to entering the compressor. Because the compressor is going to increase the pressure and temperature, but we can use the diffuser to do it also. So we get, use the diffuser as much as we can. And you'll learn about it in, uh, if you take aerospace propulsion, you'll learn why that we want to do that. 
Okay, so the question is find A, the speed of sound at the inlet, and the Mach number of the air at the entrance to the inlet. If you remember from our previous uh, lecture, that the Mach number is equal to the speed of the flow divided by the speed of sound at that point. So we have our inlet right here I've shown, and the velocity is 200 meters per second, and the temperature is 30 degrees Celsius. So let's make some assumptions. We're going to say that it's an ideal gas, and we're going to say the properties for R, it's 287 newton meters per kilogram K, and gamma is 1.4. So if we plug that in, remember the temperature was given in Celsius, so we're going to have to convert that to uh, Kelvin. So we have 1.4 times 287 newton meters per kilogram K times 303K. And because I ran out of room, I didn't show how the units cancel. But the speed was 349 meters per second. And then part B asked for the Mach number, so we just take the, the uh, velocity, which was 200 meters per second, and divide by the speed of sound, and we get a Mach number of 0.573. So the Mach number, uh, I guess we haven't talked about it yet, but anytime the Mach number is less than one, we have what's called subsonic flow. So the flow in this case is subsonic. If the Mach number were one, it would be what we call sonic, and if the Mach number were greater than one, it would be what we call supersonic flow. So in this case, we have a Mach number that's less than one, so the flow is subsonic. And that completes uh, compressible flow lecture number two. Thank you.